Um, Alright, so my project is a swerve drive and it's a type of robotic um, drivetrain. It moves a robot around. Oh, clicker. And uh, my presentation is based on the engineering design process and that's the order of slides. So the first step was to identify my problem. So the main thing that I wanted to do was to build an omnidirectional robot. Omnidirectional means that um, it can move in any direction it wants without turning. So with an ordinary car, you turn your front wheels and you go in a circular arc. But this, you just go. Like I can go diagonally this way, that way, left, right, any way I want. And the se secondary goal was to learn about manufacturing techniques. Because um, my robot's going to be custom manufactured. Most of the parts I will have to cut myself. And lastly, I wanted to learn more about engineering. And the way to learn more about engineering is not in a lecture. You can't learn much from a lecture. Um, what I've noticed in my classes is that we, they, the teachers set up a problem for you to solve, and then you teach yourself. So that's what I was trying to do. Second step was to research my problem. So there are free, free drivetrains that would allow a robot to have um, omnidirectional capabilities. They are holonomic mechanism and swerve. The hol holonomic drive uses uh, holonomic wheels and um, they have wheels on the edge of the wheels. So when you try to push the wheel on the side, it doesn't offer resistance. And the other type is the mechanism drive with these wheels. And they, have all, they also have rollers on the sides, but they're at an angle. If you spin it, um, to the conventional way, it'll actually try to push to the side. And if you have four of them and you um, you vary the speeds on each one, you can get all sorts of um, multi-directional movements. So I'll pass this around. It's a bit rusty though. And, uh, and lastly is Swerve. And Swerve works by mounting a wheel on a module and a whole thing swivels around. So in order to go the proper direction, you spin around the module and you point the wheel the way you want it to go and the robot will go that way. The step three and four is to develop possible solutions and select the best solution. The problem with holonomic and mechanism, mechanism drive is that they suffer from a loss of traction because there are wheels on the wheels that reduces your friction with the ground a lot and you lose a lot of power and I couldn't afford that. There are two types of swerve drives. There's the coaxial design shown here and the distributed, right, no that's the distributed, I'm sorry, and this is the coaxial design. Um, the distributed design is called, it gets its name from the fact that the power of the robot is distributed to each pod. It, each one of these modules have, has its own motor. And um, the problem with this is that there are wires from the main robot to each module right here. So if you try to spin it too much, it, the wires will snag and you can't turn it infinitely. It's um, hard on programming. So you have to program it to not turn too much or you break the wires and then you lose your power. So the second type is the coaxial. It's called the coaxial because there are two axles spinning on the same axis. And the axle is a cylinder on which an uh, object rotates. So this brass here is uh, one of the axles that the whole module rotates around. And on, on the inside of this brass bushing is this other axle, which turns the wheel. And how this works is that a big motor, like this, the chain, this is this rocket, it um, drives the cha chain around, like this. So this spins this loop and it spins this top rocket, which drives the wheels. So since there are no, there's no motor here and no power wires, it can spin freely. So I decided that coaxial swerve drive was the best solution. 
so how it works. Um, the center axle dri drives the uh, wheel. It does this by turning this bevel gear here, which transmits power um, perpendicularly to another bevel gear, which turns this bracket, which drives this bracket. A sprocket is pretty much a gear for a uh, for chains. It's a glossary here. And um, another problem that I had was that uh, there was a lot of friction in the system, and I wanted to get rid of it. And I used bearings to get rid of them. A bearing is a device that reduces friction. I actually have, I think, three types of bearings here. There's a normal, um, uh, I don't know what you call it. it it's a, I guess, a normal bearing. There's a specific name, but I f forgot about it. But uh, what it does is that it, uh, it has balls inside, so it allows the uh, axle inside to spin with less friction. The second type is, uh, is a thrust bearing. And the difference is that um, the load on the bearing is perpendicular to the way it spins. It, um, it's right here. It spins like that, around like this. But the force applied to it is straight up. And on these bearings, it's to the side. So that's for um, attaching it to the robot. All the weight's pushing up on it, or all the weight's pushing down, but on this pad. So it helps to spin here. And this, the gold piece is also, it's a, it's a bearing called a bushing. And it's just slick material. And it does the same thing as the normal bearings. That's how it works. Does everyone understand how this works now? Um, I could also pass this around. Uh, the fifth step is to design a prototype. And the first step of step five is to design and sketch the product. CAD, uh, CAD is it stands for a computer assisted design and it's a computer program where I can sketch these objects on a computer and uh, what's great about it is that it stores all my dimensions so I know exactly how wide this piece is or how tall it is so I, I can reference that when I get to cutting the pieces and uh, after that I took my design and I showed it to my teachers for feedback they didn't have too much to say, but um, I did change one thing on the design, and that was to make the whole system modular. Uh, this is a continuing, continuous from the building prototype. Next step is to mo do mock-ups and practice cuts, because um, metal costs a lot, so you build a, um, a cheaper model to prove that it works before you waste the material. And uh, I also, through the mock-up, I learned, I learned about, um, I learned and acquired, I learned and confirmed um, dimensions that I, that I, um, I did math to figure out, like um, the distance between the two sprockets for the chain. It had to be a specific um, spacing, or the chain would be too tight or too loose. And if the chain slips, then the wheel stops turning. So I found a calculator online that gave me a dimension for it, but I, I had no way of proving that it was, um, it was valid or not. So I drilled the holes on this piece of um, scrap and medium density fiberboard. It cost me nothing, so it was good. So that it ended up working, and I made this. Then I ordered parts. This is a picture of um, McMaster Car. They sell robotics parts, and they have a wide variety. Then there was a complication where my parts um, came two weeks late, and we also had mismatched parts. This bearing that goes on top of the module is made out of three different bearings here. The inner gray one and the outer golden one didn't fit together at first. Um, it was advertised that the silver one had an outer diameter 
the size on the outside was one and an eighth inches, and the inner di diameter of the golden piece was also one and an eighth, but it didn't fit together because um, they were slightly off. And uh, so when I order the parts, this is what I got to start to build that module. I have the wheel, the bearings, the steel rod, the gears, and uh, the metal. It comes in big plates like this. It's my tabletop here. It's a um, quarter inch aluminum. It's really tough stuff. It's tough to cut and tough to work with. But it's really strong, so it'll withstand the forces on my robot when it finally gets built. Uh, a big, uh, big theme of, uh, of my build was nominal dimensions. It's messed me up in the past. Uh, na the nominal comes from a French word, nom, meaning name. So the dimensions are just by name. It's not this actual dimension. A good example of this is um, 2 by 4 lumber. By his name, you would assume that it measures 2 inches by 4 inches, but um, if you measure it, it's actually, um, it's actually 1 and a half by 3 and a half. It's vastly different from the 2 by 4 that it's named after. Um, also, um, a phrase shaft, the, the rod that we use. I bought two, two versions of these. They were both um, 3 8 in diameter, but only this one would fit in a 3 8 bearing. If you actually measure it, it's about like two thousandths of an inch underneath uh, 3 8 So the next step was uh, to build the final product. And the first process that I, manufacturing process that I used was turning. And turning is cutting circular pieces on the lathe. This is a, a major manufacturing tool that we have in the wood shop here. How it works is that these jaws here, it, it holds my workpiece and it spins it. And then this tool post here holds a cutting cutting piece, a cutting head, and it pushes it into the into the cylinder. As it spins, it removes material. And I had to use these to cut the sleeve bearings here, and the axles, and um, the sprocket. I needed to cut the inside diameter to, to uh, a bigger dimension to fit this. The next up was to do rough cuts. So I had to cut this big sheet into smaller pieces that I could handle, because I can't cut precision parts on a giant piece. So I'd use the uh, bandsaw and the jigsaw to cut into smaller pieces first. I call them blanks. That's what I passed around. So I cut that, and I, put, I could put it in the clamp of another piece and start cutting it. Um, a third process was milling. And I use our uh, CNC mill. That stands for Computer Numeric Control. So. Um, how it works is that it has a cutter head. Are we familiar with a drill bit? So it works like a drill bit, except it has cutting surfaces on all sides, so it can cut sideways as well as um, conventionally going down. What, how it works is that this clamp here holds my workpiece, and these um, these dials, I guess you would call them, um, moves this table. In the, the axis, in the four axes, it goes left and right, forward and back, and up and down. But um, instead of me having to crank those, the computer controls it and it moves on its own. It's more accurate than what I could do by hand, and uh, it can do fancy cuts like a circle. It would be really hard to crank those to to match up into a circle. And uh, I use it to cut. Um, aluminum plates. Uh, it's controlled by what's called G-code, is the machine language. So the, the the, I had to program the, the mill to cut the parts for me. And 
it would control the path that the table took, which is called the toolpath. This is a, an example of a, a line of G code. G01 is, um, is uh, I forget, but it, it, um, it, um, it moves uh, these two axes, X and Y. So it says X1, Y1, so it tells it to go in the, to the right, X uh, positive 1, so it goes right 1 inch, and the Y, it goes forward 1 inch, so it goes diagonal. And then the next one, Geo3, is a, a counterclockwise circle. So it moves a bit in a counterclockwise circle. The, y, the X and the Y number stands for, um, stands for um, the starting position of the bit relative to the center of the circle. And I and J are the ending points of the arc. And, uh, next up, after programming, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go ahead and cut it and try um, getting Miller cut the first time, because since I met, had to manually um, program it, it could it wasn't reliable. I was afraid of making mistakes. So to do to uh, practice, I would use cheaper materials like plastic to cut my pieces. This is a practice cut of the side of that of that module, and uh, I also use a program called Cut Viewer, and it it uh, it's a computer simulation of the mill. So I use those two to um, confirm my cuts before wasting good material. Um, so I can pass this around to And uh, to confirm my cuts, I would measure them to make sure they're the right diameter. Uh, this is a caliper. It's used to accurately measure outer and inner diameters or thickness. It, uh, you put stuff inside its jaws, the upper and lower. This one measures the outside, this one measures the inside. And it has a nice digital display that would tell me the uh, dimension that I was measuring. And it's accurate to the 10 thousandths of an inch. And uh, here's a combination square. It's used to measure length pr um, primarily, but also has nice attachments. This one finds the center of a circle, and this one measures angles. Uh, questions, comments, concerns? Um, the equipment that you used, is that available here? We yeah, the, the CNC mill we, we got two years ago in the engineering department. Uh -huh. We started using it this year. And when you programmed the G code, that wasn't computerized program. You said you had to do it. Yeah, manually. there there are computer programs to do it, but it it's been proven uh, incompatible with our machine. So I manually read it, and it can be like up to like a page long. I have an example um, on my computer that I didn't show. I'm sorry. Honda Prelude did something with their tires, that they turned the tires and you didn't have the back into a parking space. Mm -hmm. I think that car only lasted like a year. <laughs> but I would have loved to have that with the tires. Just slide right in. Nissan. They, they, they turned a little bit, not all the way. Oh, not all the with way? The back tires yeah. would actually turn a little bit. Oh, did you see that? Because that's what you're thinking. I didn't see that, but I saw a uh, Nissan prototype car and it it's sort of like a strip drive, but it's limited. It's only used for um, parallel parking and nowhere else, because you have some serious safety concerns and um, mechanical issues if we were to drive um, with strip drive on open roads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think so. You can imagine if, <laughs> if you can go in any direction, just think about the car crashes. Mm -hmm. So when you put this all together, and I see this little platform down there, mm -hmm. um, did it actually work the way you wanted it to? Uh, can you rephrase that question? Um, when you got your wheels, it is a wheel, right? Right. Okay. So um, what happened was that I ran out of time to build. That one was one of four modules that would be on the, on the robot. It would That's right now. The front. Yeah. That, was, that was supposed to be like my final robot. But uh, it, it just takes so much time to machine those parts. 
um, just those circles. I just practice piece here. Um, there was one time where I um, I programmed the mill wrong, and the the cutting bit. This one actually um, went into my clamp, which is made of hardened steel, so it destroyed the, the bit. The next cut I've tried to use, it actually uh, melted the aluminum instead of cutting. And these were the circles were practice cuts. Each of these are a different diameter. By it's off by uh, about two. Ten thousandths of an inch off each, and only one of these holes will fit this bearing. Uh, I actually ran into problems with heat. If it was slightly warmer, like a five degrees or so, it wouldn't cut properly. And uh, I, I also had to use cutting oil. Um, cutting oil is used to lubricate the bit and keep the temperatures cool. In industrial practices, they either submerge this whole plate in oil. Or squirt it constantly. With water. We have what? With water? No, uh, with oil. oil. But we have a bottle about this size, and I would, well, I was only allowed to uh, apply drops to it. Mm -hmm. The amount of uh, even the amount of oil would uh, would change the outcome of the cut. But um. So your cuts have to be exact. Right? Exact. Or wheels. Yeah. But uh. Since I have a program down, the next one will be easier. Mm -hmm. I also came with a demo bot that does the same thing as my final robot that I was going to demonstrate. Would now be a good time? Yes. So these things on sides correspond to that module over there. And they s swivel around completely. Um, you built this? Yeah. We, uh, this is a proof of concept before I even well, did CAD. So the, this have to be cut uh, exactly too? Uh, well, this this one's made out of Legos. It's not as oh. exact. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see the Legos, but it's okay. The final one is. But, uh, so I can go in this direction, and it's, um, it's an IR controller, so it's not as reliable. So I can't. I've been switch, shifting directions. Yeah, you can oh, okay. I still want it to fall down. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you can see how. Um, uh, come. So if this was my parking sl slot, it would be really easy. <laughs> I, I expect a car like that in the future if you go to MIT or something. Yeah. Do you have other specific ideas about what you would want to do with a prototype like that? Prototype like this? Yeah. Or? I mean, what are the kinds of things you would want it to do? Uh, no. Like, uh, so you're talking about cars, but are there other things that you would want it to do? Yeah. Well, it's for our robotics team. We play um, we play games every year. This year, we played basketball, but um, the swerve drive would help us maneuver around other robots or um, position ourselves to score easy. What about other uses? In society, beside oh, cars. So, okay. forklifts. <laughs> um, this one, it, it's been used in forklifts since um, since they, inside a factory you have perfectly smooth walls and very few obstacles or other cars. It's actually safe to use, and they're at low speeds. So this one uses a swerve drive, and you can do some pretty neat things with it. But the primary use is that you can, if you're a forklift and with a conventional steering and so, so your, your box that you put on your shelf has to be perpendicular, you have to go in perpendicularly so if you miss by four inches you have to back out and turn again in the line but with a swerve drive like that you just go sideways and you go in. installed in cars for say parking purposes. Mm -hmm. But but you said it was dangerous to use on the open road and <laughs> I mean would there be would there be a practical way of actually in, installing this in a car where where you, you would just shut it off if you're if you're actually driving and only use it for parking. I mean, would that make any sense? Um, it, it wouldn't be cost effective. Mm -hmm. There's so many moving parts. Like on that there there are um, four spinning axles. 
and uh, on a car you would have suspension and all sorts of stuff. And with each stage where you are, where where you're using gears or chain, it is inefficient. With gears you lose 10%. With chains you lose like 20%. So by the time you get your engine power to the wheels, you'd be losing about half the power. It's just not cost effective. And repair fees too. Just think about how much repair we do on the cars now, but with that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and my other question is, so did, you, did I hear you say that now that you have a model, it's going to take you less time to build the next one? Is that what you said? Right, because um, I already know what all my cuts are, and I already programmed the milling machine. Mm -hmm. So I just run the same program again, and it'll get me the same piece. Mm -hmm. So in, ter in terms of cost effectiveness, I mean, if this were to develop in, in the future, um, would it, would it always have to be hand cut, or would there be a way to it mechanize it? it? It could be mechanized, but it's it's just still more um, more complex than uh, conventional designs. Yeah. Uh, one more question. Just a comment. Um, I had the pleasure of seeing your informal, mm -hmm. and um, just not being a technical person at all. Hearing it a second time, it makes so much more sense to me. Um, and also, a little more detail today was really helpful. Um, so I appreciate mm -hmm. how you explained and took us through the steps. Thank you.